Uh, I'm Brett Drummond, um, one of the co-founders of MS Translate, uh, involved in MS Research and our main science communicator. As always, uh, we're just going to give this a little bit of time for people to come on board, see that we're now broadcasting live, um, but we'll be getting started uh, talking about remyelination tonight. So we've already got a couple of questions that have been submitted by members of our community. Um, and uh, I've also got a few studies that I want to talk about. So we'll be getting started on that shortly, but we'll just um, give a few minutes so that everyone can, can come on board um, and start watching. If you are now watching, um, feel free to, to say hi. Let me know that you're there. Uh, it's always nice to know who's on the other side of the screen. Um, so say hi, say good evening. Uh, feel free to start submitting any questions that you might have, but we'll get started, as I said, in a few minutes once um, we've given everyone a little bit of time to to see that the broadcast is happening. But I can see already that we've got a number of people who are, are in and watching, so hello, welcome. Let me know if you've participated in these MS Translate before, let me know if this is your first time. Um, would be good to know. So, as I said, we'll be getting started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, but the topic for tonight's uh, Q&A is myelin repair or remyelination, which has been a hot topic in the news lately, and we'll be talking about that. Um, we'll be talking about it uh, in general and, uh, and other studies that have come out recently as well. So if you have questions, if you've got things that you're interested in, as always, um, all you have to do is drop a, a comment um, into the uh, comment box. There we go, I'll remember that in a second. Into the comment box just, just next to the broadcast um, and I'll be able to see it and I'll be responding to to all of the, the questions and comments that we receive as we go on. So, if you are now watching, oh, avoid that. Um, so I can see that we've already got a number of people on board. Hi Debbie, hi Diego, hi Georgia. Welcome, first time, great Georgia. It's great to have you on board. Um, thank you for participating. Hi Fiona, great that you can make it um, early morning in Scotland. Um, for you, but thank you for, for coming on board um, and making the um, waking up early to, to, I guess, come and listen to this. I've got your question already written down, but obviously you can submit it um, as we're going through as, as well. Um, so we've got a lot of people already here, um, so why don't we get started now? Um, and, and we'll just get started on it. So as I said, tonight we're going to be talking about um, myelin repair or remyelination. Um, and this is a, a hugely important topic um, in multiple sclerosis. And for those who have followed MS Translate for a while, um, you'll know that I've talked a lot about this as being the next real frontier in terms of what we're looking for um, for multiple sclerosis um, treatment really, um, because now we have a lot of um, medications that are quite effective at stopping new damage from occurring, especially the newer um, highly potent therapies um, are quite effective in a lot of people in terms of being able to, to stop new damage from occurring, but we don't have anything um, yet that really can repair any of that existing damage. And that's obviously really important because um, when we're talking about really being able to manage the disease and treat the disease, we don't just want to be able to stop it from, from going further, especially for people who are, who are watching this now, um, who may have already had MS um, for a number of years. What you're really looking for is something that can help reverse the disease um, and start to improve symptoms. And to be able to do that, we need to be able to repair some of that damage. And that's um, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so, hi Leanne, hi Wendy, we've got a lot of people on board which is fantastic. Um, <coughs> so thank you for, for participating. Um, as I said before, if you've just joined us, um, obviously talking about remyelination and myelin repair, 
If you do have any questions, um, just, just put them in the comments and I'll be answering all of the questions as we go along. I apologise um, in advance for my voice. Um, I've obviously come down with something over the past 24 hours and so I'm not sounding my best, but I, I'm hopeful that my voice will last out um, the length of the Q&A, but uh, forgive me if I keep having some order as we go through just to, just to keep me going. So, um, let me start, I guess, by um, responding to a couple of the questions that we've received in advance of the Q&A, and thank you to the people who um, already submitted questions. That's fantastic. Um, as we're going along as well, I did a poll. We did a poll earlier in the week talking about the use of events um, and whether or not creating an event um, on Facebook for things like this is helpful um, in terms of being able to be made aware of them also so that you can sign up and get a reminder. If you didn't vote in that poll or you want to comment further, um, feel free to let us know if that's useful because if it is, we will keep, keep doing it. Also gives you the opportunity to submit those questions in advance. But so one of those questions that we got um, was from Michael, um, <coughs> who said it, he had two parts to his question. The first part was, um, with past damage, do we have the possibility to, to fix some of that damage? And I guess that's um, something that I've already just touched upon a little bit, but it's, it's worth going um, into again in, in a little bit more detail, especially for those people that, that might have just joined into... Um, I guess, answer Michael's question directly. Um, so the simple answer, uh, Michael, is yes, that, that's the goal of, of free myelination and, and, and myelin repair therapies, is that dif differently to the existing therapies, which are all about stopping new damage, um, these are all about fixing past damage, fixing existing damage and repairing that myelin sheath. So obviously, um, in multiple sclerosis, what happens is that the myelin gets damaged and that's what leads to a lot of this, the symptoms that we see in terms of you know, pain, cognitive problems, um, <coughs> tremor, spasticity. Um, and so while we can stop new damage from occurring with, with existing therapies um, in most people, and I always have to stress that it's most people because we know that with um, MS therapies, you know, they, they don't work for everyone. Um, but the hope with these new therapies that we hope will, will start to come out um, in the near future um, is that we will have therapies that can repair that, that existing damage and fix that damage that occurs with the hope then that if we, if we fix that damage that um, it also starts to reverse some of those symptom problems that, that we talked about and you actually see some, some improvement. So it's not just slowing the progression of the disease, it's actually starting to starting to reverse it. Um, and that's obviously crucially important. Um, hi Tony, hi Kathy, um, new people, hi Hope, new people watching, fantastic to have you on board. Feel free to submit any questions that you have in the, in the comments box. Um, so Michael's second part was asking about what about after HSCT? So um, it's an interesting question. Um, Really, in terms of what we what we know at the moment about HSCT, and I know a lot, a lot of people um, who are regulars to these will have heard me talk about HSCT many times before, but um, for those people who might be uh, new to MS Translate or new to these broadcasts, um, a quick little snapshot in terms of what we're talking about. With that, um, HSCT is um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant which is essentially um, chemotherapy to wipe out the existing immune system um, and then a bone marrow transplant so that the immune system can be rebooted. The idea being that if it's the immune system that's causing the problems um, and causing the damage, that if we wipe out the immune system that's there and put in a new, new version of it, um, a reset version of it, that um, that damage will, will stop occurring. Now, with what the ones that we have at the moment, we're putting um, the same person's bone marrow back in, so really they're the same immune cells, um, but they're being set put back to a time before they knew to attack. Um, and what we've seen from that so far is that it can be, in some people, um, a really effective long-term therapy um, for multiple sclerosis. Their trials are still ongoing with that. 
in terms of um, remyelination and, and myelin repair, there's nothing really to suggest yet in terms of data that I've seen that HSCT is going to, to lead to that. It really is in the class of existing therapies that we have in terms of it's going to stop the damage. Um, whether or not it can stop the damage so effectively that maybe there's a potential that then the body could start to repair itself. I don't think we have that information yet, um, but there's certainly nothing about the therapy itself that would lend itself, um, sorry, I keep saying self, um, that would lend um, itself to that happening. Um, what we can say about that um, is that there's a different type of stem cell therapy that's being looked into um, that um, may be able to do that. Now, before I get onto that, what uh, what I think is worth saying at the moment um, is actually talking about the process of myelin repair. And what's important to, to realize um, is that demyelination isn't that uncommon. Um, if you um, get a concussion or sometime with, it, with infections or, you know, knocks to the head, um, demyelination can occur. It's just that um, generally, the, the body is quite effective at being able to repair that damage to the myelin in, in these small areas. However, what we know is that in people with multiple sclerosis, that repair process is blocked. And so we're going to, let's just go through a couple of terms quickly that will come up regularly if you're um, reading about myelin repair research or remyelination research. Um, so what happens when there is demyelination is that uh, cells um, are accreted to the site. And those cells are called um, OPCs um, or oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And once they get there, two things are meant to happen. Those cells are meant to divide so that they get more of them um, and they're meant to mature. Um, the important part of them maturing is that then they turn into oligodendrocytes, mature oligodendrocytes, which are then the cells that are capable of producing myelin and repairing this damage. Now, what we know in multiple sclerosis is that often those OPCs can get damaged and actually destroyed, but also that maturing process doesn't um, happen. So you have immature um, OPCs there that don't um, turn into the oligodendrocytes and so that, that myelin can't be formed. Um, so a lot of the research that's going on um, is looking at how do we promote that process? How can we make more um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells or OPCs convert into mature oligodendrocytes so that myelin can be made? So just as, a, as an idea as to some of the terms that you may hear, all mature, mature oligodendrocytes are the cells that are going to make the myelin, so that's what we're interested in. OPCs are essentially the baby version of that, they're the, they're the precursor to that, the starting point that we need to transition across. So those are two cell types that you might hear or read about a little bit. That's sort of the key parts that you need to, to know about them. Um, so Michael, thanks for, for joining in and watching Michael. Um, so Michael's followed up from his question, which is fantastic. Um, could remyelination meds still uh, work still after HSCT? Yeah, um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know, uh, is my completely honest answer because we don't um, have any yet. Um, but there's no reason to suggest why they wouldn't be able to because they're looking at really looking at different processes so um, there's nothing about the process of HSCT that I can think of and this is just me um, talking about my understanding of, it, of everything that goes on um, there's nothing about that that would suggest that you couldn't then use a, a remyelinating therapy in combination with it and it's actually a fantastic point because one of the things, and we're going to get to the, the recent study that was um, got a lot of media attention um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and one of the things that I got slightly frustrated with, and I, I made that point on MS Translate, and I made that point in other places that it was um, published, is that it talked about um, you know a cure for MS, 
Um, and, you know, aside from the fact that it was very early stage research, um, as we've talked about before, this isn't um, as a myelin repair, potential myelin repair therapy, it's, it's not a cure. Um, and I actually had a, a fantastic conversation um, last week um, with Stephen Petratos, who is the, the lead author on, on that study um, about his work, and we're, we're pretty hopeful that he will, um, at some stage in the future, come on to MS Translate and maybe do one of these Q&As if there's interest in that, if you'd be interested in having him come and talk about his research, which is really interesting stuff. Um, you know, comment and, and let us know that. Um, but uh, it's, it's not a cure, and he completely agreed and, and shared my frustration with um, how it was reported. But what I have written about um, before on MS Translate is um, the potential for us to redefine what a cure is. Um, and to me, instead of actually talking about a, a cure, and a cure is going to be difficult in the, the near future because we still don't know what causes MS and so being able to cure it is going to be difficult. But what we can potentially have in the, in the nearish future um, is really, really effective, complete management um, of the disease. And, and that really has three arms to it. One of those arms is with the existing therapies that we have at the moment, which are about stopping new damage. And as I've already said, a lot of them work um, quite well um, for a lot of people. Uh, and we can include HSCT in there potentially as one that will start to be more widespread um, in the future. Then the second arm, so that's stopping new damage. Then we have a second arm, which will be these myelin repair therapies, which can then repair existing damage. So now we're stopping things from getting worse, but we're actually starting to make things better by repairing the damage um, that's there. And I think when I've talked about this before, I've talked about getting home, getting home and finding that your basement's flooded. Um, and so what we have at the moment is a way of essentially putting a, you know, you've got a pipe down there that's leaking. What we've got is a way of putting a plug in in that hole so that it stops more water from coming in. But while that's great in terms of stopping things from getting worse, your basement's still flooded. And so we need a way, you know, in that situation, you obviously then look to drain the water. You want to reverse the problem. And that's the what these remyelination therapies will do. So we'll be able to stop more water from coming in, but we'll also start to be able to fix the problem and fix the, you know, the flooded basement by starting to repair that myelin. I think the third arm then that fits in with all of this um, will then be um, lifestyle modifications. And, and really that those lifestyle modifications and the more that we're um, finding out about these things, and I'm, I'm going to talk about them tonight because there's a lot that, a lot of it that also relates to, to myelin repair. I think these things are all really tightly linked is that things like diet and exercise are really important to help maintain a healthy environment within the body so that these other therapies can work as effectively as they can. So I think that, um, you know, that's a redefined cure. So when Michael, you say, could it work, could remyelination works, meds work after HSCT, I don't see any reason why not. And I think that that's um, really what we're going to be looking at in the future is that you have a combination. You have one of the existing medications um, and you have a remyelination medication working in concert with each other to do these two separate things. So hopefully that um, answers your question. Feel free to share if I'm being clear uh, about what I'm saying. Um, certainly, you know, our mindset with all of these things is always if it's not making sense, that's because I'm not explaining it well enough. Um, so do let me know um, if there's anything that you want me to explain further or if you've got, you know, you've understood what I've said, but there's more questions that you have on it because um, <clears throat> I'd be more than happy to, to go into more detail. So that was that, and I can, I can see that we've got a lot of people watching at the moment, which is fantastic. Welcome to everyone that is watching. Um, if, you're, if you haven't said hi yet, feel free to say hi in the comments box. Let me know who's, who's here and who's watching. 
Um, if you missed the introduction or this is your first um, MS Translate Facebook Live Q&A, um, if you do have questions, this is all about participation. Um, it's all about me sharing information that you're interested in. Um, so if you do have any questions along the way, all you need to do is just pop a comment um, there. I'll be able to see that as we go along. Um, and then I will um, respond to, to all of the questions that we um, received tonight. Now Michael, thank you mate. Yes, you have. FYI, I've had HSC, HSCT and follow OMS still trying. Fantastic, Michael. Um, you know, hopefully we'd love to hear. We've shared a couple of personal stories um, on MS Translate before about people who went through HSCT um, for mixed results. We're always interested to, to hear and for people to share these stories because people are really interested in it. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in sharing your story and your journey um, in more detail, post, send us a, a private message to MS Translate um, after the broadcast and, and we'd love to, to talk more. Hi Andrea, welcome. Um, we've just been talking about um, Stephen's study, um, which you're aware of, and it's fantastic, fantastic work. Um, but what I want to jump back to now um, is talking about a different type of stem cell. So we talked about HSCT and how that might work in combination with a with a myelin repair therapy, but we can talk about another type of stem cells that um, are already being trialled for this type of um, impact, and, and those are mesenchymal stem cells. And you may remember we've we've talked about those before um, at length, um, both in Facebook Live broadcasts and in, in articles that we've written. And a few years ago now, we did an interview uh, with Dr. Violaine Harris, um, who works at the, the Tisch MS Centre uh, in New York, who are one of the leaders in terms of looking at these mesenchymal stem cells um, for multiple sclerosis. And they've finished a, a phase one trial of that. Um, and the latest that I'm aware of is that they were recruiting to, to undertake a phase two, um, phase two A trial um, of that treatment. So what's important to understand, and, and I'm, I get that throughout this broadcast, we're already using quite a few different terms, which can be confusing and so I'll try and step through um, what we're talking about here but what's important to understand is that these stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells, um, have a different role to the ones that we were talking about in HSCT which were the hematopoietic stem cells. Now you don't need to, to remember the names at all, just remember H and M. Um, uh, and so in the hematopoietic stem cells, those stem cells um, were involved in rebooting the immune system. Whereas we know that these mesenchymal stem cells um, have the potential to um, go in and be those sort of neural cells that we've talked about before, so in terms of the OPCs and the oligodendrocytes. So they can go more down that pathway. So the hope is that with those sorts of stem cells, <coughs> pardon me, with those type of stem cells that will be looking at getting more myelin repair. So HSCT, more involved in stopping the disease progression. Mesenchymal stem cells, more about repairing damage. Um, and that's, that's still at a very early stage. Um, the results have looked promising, um, but we, we definitely still need to know more about how those cells can be used and they're the most effective way to do it because at the moment we don't know if it's the cells themselves that are important or if it's something that they release um, and obviously if we could work out um, whatever factor it is that they release um, that would be an even better um, option for a therapeutic um, because uh, it's better than injecting cells essentially um, but all of that work is still being done at the moment to try and work that out. Um, we'd love to get um, Tish on board uh, to talk more about that that work um, later this year. Ectrams, um, as you know, the previous two years we've been at Ectrams in, in Berlin and in Stockholm. Later this year, Ectrams is actually going to be in Washington, D.C. Every so often they do a joint conference um, in America. Um, and so, you know, some of the American groups might be more 
um, likely to, to attend and present at this. So, you know, we may be able to get catch up with Tish there and find out more about what they're doing with with those trials and find out what stage they're they're actually up to. Um, so just scrolling back a little bit, and again, feel free to ask comments, uh, ask questions as, as we go through. Um, Leanne, when do you think trials for MS will start if they're already doing it? So I assume you're talking about in terms of remyelination therapies or myelin repair therapies. There are already some trials um, going on. Um, so as I said, Tish um, uh, entering into a phase two trial with their, with their mesenchymal stem cells. Um, we know that Biogen has been trialing um, a remyelination therapy called Antilingo, um, which you may have heard about a few years ago because one of their trials, um, this, this was quite a hyped medication um, and it showed some really positive results in, in early stage um, trials. They, they took it into, into human trials um, and had uh, one of the trials basically completely failed. Um, my understanding with that is that it was put down mostly to um, trial design and study design and so they are in the, the process of undertaking that trial again now um, with a, a different trial design. Um, so the, the, there are already ones under being being undertaken around the world. Um, you know, we can also talk about Novaron and Travis Stiles' work. Now that's not in human trials at the moment, that's still all being developed. Um, but, you know, that's another avenue for, for remyelination work um, and all of that's also featured on, on our website. We've done interviews with Travis before and again, we're kind of hopeful that we might be able to uh, do a Facebook Live with Travis uh, in the near future. Um, so that he can come on and talk more about his work as well. So for, for those who were, were listening before when we were talking about um, Stephen Petratos' work, fantastic work that was featured recently, Stephen's actually watching, um, I've just been informed. So hi Stephen, thank you for participating. Obviously with your expertise, um, please feel free to, to comment along. Um, you know, this is an area that, that you know far more than me about. Um, so feel free to, to share your insights as well as, as we go on. Um, hi Brendan, thank you for, for joining us. Hopefully the, the kids um, behave themselves with the washing up. But thank you for, for participating again. Um, feel free to submit any questions that you have. Um, Leanne, with the M stem cells, is there a cutoff for when you can't have it like HSCT? Um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't think we have that information yet. And realistically, that information for HSCT has come through many different trials um, where now there's sort of an indication and quite a bit of data to suggest that the people who are most likely to benefit um, are those who have relapsing or remitting MS, um, have highly inflammatory disease, highly active disease, and are quite early um, in their disease stage after um, after diagnosis. Um, and that's probably got a lot to do with um, the disease process and how HSCT works. Um, you know, there's, as I sort of have shared before, um, a thought that we, we have two different distinct things that happen in MS. We have inflammation, which is the big driver of the disease early on and in the relapsing remitting part of it. And then we have degeneration, which drives the, the disease later on and more in those progressive types. And HSCT is really going to be dealing with the inflammatory um, side of it. So, you know, once that balance shifts and it's, it's more of a degeneration problem, um, that's why HSCT might not be as effective. Um, you know, that's sort of just an opinion sharing at the moment, but a lot of the data has suggested it could be more beneficial early on. In terms of mesenchymal stem cells, um, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. My, my honest answer is I don't know. Um, there is some 
some interesting stuff um, that suggests that age could be important for um, myelin debris clearance, which could be important for myelin repair. And so there was a, a there's been a couple of studies um, on this, and there was another one recently by a, a German group that I, I've just seen um, that essentially have showed, and, and there was a group at, at Cambridge, Robin Franklin's group at Cambridge, have also looked into this, um, that actually getting rid of, so when myelin gets attacked and damaged and, and degraded, um, you're left with all of what's essentially rubble. Um, we're left with all of this damaged myelin um, floating around. And what these groups have shown in various studies and in early research is that actually getting rid of that um, rubble, um, for want of a better term, that's not the scientific term, that's, that's a Brett term, um, is actually important to help um, myelin repair. So if you can get rid of that, um, the, the repair of the damaged myelin is much more effective. Um, and, and Robin Franklin's group had some really interesting research showing that the cells responsible for clearing that rubble um, get less um, good at doing it as they get older. Um, and he did some really interesting experiments, and, and this is a few years ago now that I, that I remember hearing about it. Um, but the, the crux of it was if they took a young, my, a young mouse and essentially stitched it together with an old mouse, the cells responsible for clearing um, the myelin from the young mouse were able to go and do it in the old mouse because they were now connected um, and it helped them be able to then go and repair the myelin. Um, so that's all, it's all pretty early though. Um, you know, I don't, we certainly don't um, know hugely um, about that at the moment, um, but there is some insights into that as to whether that has any impact on um, mesenchymal stem cells. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know we know the answer yet. Um, so just reading a couple more questions that have come through. Um, so, Nemor, MSRA should keep a registry on all people who did the stem cells. Any type at the moment, the registry is not working as it should. Hopefully soon they will get the info again so we can learn from it. Um, yeah, look, I think um, certainly the plan is that, that all of this data is going to be recorded. Um, you know, there are lots of databases now around the world that is capturing all of this information. It's really important. Um, having long-term access to clinical data on people on all treatments um, is um, hugely important and it's allowing us to, to find out um, lots of things and we've featured research um, over the past 12 months from the Clinical Outcomes Research Unit um, here in Melbourne led by Thomas Kalinchik um, that's found some pretty cool stuff um, using that sort of data so it is really important that we um, capture it. Um, Limo did say that I wonder if Diptera is a current medication and why did you choose that one for the trial? So I'll answer that briefly. It is a current medication used in different disease. In terms of why I use it for the trial, um, as what I will say is, you know, while I've encouraged myself, encouraged Stephen to, to participate if he wants, um, you know, we will hopefully at some stage, um, not to put any pressure, but it would be great, you know, if we if we could do one of these with Stephen to talk about his work. So we won't try and let's not try and direct too many questions to him tonight while he's trying to just um, enjoy and relax. Um, but we will certainly follow up. Um, as I said, I had a great chat with Stephen. Um, he's doing a lot of fantastic work, not just the one that was, was published. And, and, you know, we, we're really interested in featuring more of it and promoting that work. So um, we are hopeful that we'll be able to do that at, at some point. Um, Meza, can you talk about the diabetes drug? Um, sorry, I forgot the name. I've read a few articles about the potential remyelination properties of an older drug. So I think the drug that you're talking about here is metformin. Um, and yes, it has shown some interesting potential for remyelination. Um, and we featured um, a study from the University of Cambridge um, late last year, it was around October last year, um, that looked into 
um, metformin and how it could be uh, involved in myelin repair. Um, and interestingly, this, this study um, wasn't just about using metformin. Um, actually, what they were initially interested in um, was looking at how intermittent fasting um, could have an impact. And so they had groups of mice, um, one group ate normally, another group was on an alternate um, day eating um, protocol, so essentially you know, eating every second day um, for this intermittent fasting. And what they found um, in these mice was that um, they could see some evidence of um, myelin repair essentially. And we've got um, a video summary of this work that we'll drop into the comments section as well that um, you can go and watch to get some more details about that because it was a really interesting study. And so they found that. And then what they were interested in doing, and this is how metformin comes in, is that metformin is a diabetes drug that is meant to to play a similar sort of role to, to fasting. It helps to, to promote fasting. Um, the same sort of processes and what they found, they really used that as a way of um, confirming their results. And they found that using metformin um, in group mice versus not, um, they saw that they got very similar results with the metformin as they did with the mice that had intermittent fasting. Um, so that was, you know, again, interesting results, especially across um, a number of different areas because that's obviously looking at a potential dietary way of um, being able to achieve these, these benefits as well as a, a pharmaceutical approach to do it. Now, as we talked about with lots of research, this is done in, in a mouse model at the moment, so we have to wait and see whether or not... Um, that progresses to anything once it goes to, to human trials. I know that the Cambridge group were, were keen to progress that that work, um, but we'll have to see how that all how that all goes. Um, more, there is also an antihistamine drug that has remyelination properties. Yeah, so this was um, clemistine, uh, clemistine fumarate, um, which was uh, discovered by a group at um, UC San Francisco. Um, led by uh, Professor Ari Green, um, where essentially they were just screening um, a lot of existing compounds to see whether or not they could find anything that could potentially um, help with myelin repair. And they found uh, this one, um, which was a compound found in an antihistamine, um, over-the-counter antihistamine that seemed to have um, some benefits in terms of the studies that they did. Now this was just looking at um, in, a, in a model system. Again, this hasn't, as far as I'm aware, gone into any human trials yet. Um, this was a couple of years ago that, that, that they had this finding, so it would be interesting to know um, what stage they're up to at the moment. I did um, in Berlin in 2018, I'm trying to remember my cities and my years, Berlin in 2018, I did have a, a chat with Ari Green about this work, um, which we haven't yet published um, to MS Translate. Uh, we're still looking to try and do that, um, where he does provide an update, so we may still look to, to get that out um, in the near future as well. But yet yeah, there are a number of compounds. I mean, the take-home message here is that there are a number of compounds that are being looked into that have the potential to, to do this. Um, it's a really exciting avenue of research. Um, lots of people are, around the world are, are looking into it um, and coming at it from a number of different angles. And I guess the, the positive of that is that the, the more irons we have in the fire, the more likely we are to find something that works. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a really great thing that this is the, the state of research um, in this area at the moment. Um, so just scrolling back through some comments. Um, Leanne, thank you, good explanation. Thank you. Uh, and well done, Stephen. Yes, fantastic work for Stephen. Um, Brendan, are we entering a period where in Australia we are still slow to engage with globally available stem cell therapy? And by the time it is accepted and available, many will be too old to be considered as prime candidates. Hmm. It's not an easy question to answer. Um, you know, I think... 
Um, there is certainly stem cell work going on at the moment. Now, in terms of the mesenchymal stem cell work, um, it, it is very new and I'm not sure of anyone here at the moment that's doing it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, you know, a lot of the, the early stage research, um, we have to wait until it gets published to, to hear about. Um, there is HSCT trials going on, especially up in Sydney through uh, John Moore's group. Um, so it is being, being used here um, in that trial setting. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it is really difficult. And, uh, you know, I mean, I have um, the privilege um, in a way um, of getting to be um, in the middle of both of these worlds. Um, in terms of, you know, my research background um, means that uh, I get to interact with the researchers and I get to go to conferences and I get to stay on top of all of the work that's, that's going on. Um, and then, you know, I'm in a fortunate position that I can communicate that back to the, the MS community. Um, but at the same time, I also interact um, hugely with the MS community through, you know, our social media platforms, through these... Facebook live discussions as well as, you know, I, I give a number of talks to, to peer support groups um, around Australia. Um, and so, you know, I also uh, now, much more than I was when I was in the lab, um, I'm hugely aware of, you know, the, the, the frustration um, that can be felt by people living with MS about how long it takes some of these things to happen. And so it's, you know, it is a it is a difficult situation. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think there is an easy answer to that question. Um, Brendan, um, you know, I think researchers here and, you know, I've already talked about, um, some tonight, but researchers here are, are working incredibly hard, um, to make discoveries. And I think we do, um, in a way in Australia, punch above our, our weight, um, in terms of, you know, considering the size of the country and the, the size of the resources, um, that, um, you know, we have, we have some fantastic research going on here, um, where we have a number of, of different breakthroughs, we have a number of, you know, high profile, um, publications, uh, um, in MS research. Um, could we be doing more? Um, you know, I, I sort of always believe that we can be doing more. Um, you know, I believe that on a very personal level about MS Translate um, and we're always you know, in conversations about what else can we be doing to, to you know, help communicate better, to, to help improve the lives of people living with MS. Um, researchers, you know, they always want things to be progressing faster as well. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a really, I know that's probably not um, as blunt an answer as, as perhaps you were looking for. I, I understand that I'm sitting on the fence with it, but that's, that's not because um, I'm trying not to say anything controversial. More than happy to say things that are controversial, I just, I, I honestly don't think that there's an easy answer to that question. Um, the unfortunate reality is that, that, that these things take time. Um, I think in Australia we're doing, we're doing really well with a lot of research. Um, is HSCT an area where we could be doing more in? Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see what sort of funding goes towards that over the next couple of years because, you know, I think the data for it is becoming um, overwhelming. Um, in terms of um, the benefits that it can have for, for people living with with MS, um, certainly some people. So I think, you know, I'm pretty sure late last year um, Scotland approved it as a as a funded therapy, or it was approved on their their NHS um, in Scotland for, for people living with MS, which was one of the first countries in the world, if not the first country. Um, so, you know, it's always, um, 
a question of where do we go for it, where do we go from there. It will, yeah. I think it has a lot of momentum behind it. Um, we tend to um, follow the lead of America with these things. Often, if something gets FDA approval, um, or things become more common there in Europe, then that tends to tends to happen here. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a valid question. Sorry, I, I you know I'm going around in circles now. I, I hope that was some sort of an answer, uh, but it, it's probably the best. Um, so just scrolling, sorry, there's been a number of comments come through, um, so let me just get back through through those. I thought I heard, so Kathy, I thought I heard there was to be a study at either the Alfred or the Austin, but I'm not sure. Yes, Austin. Is that um, Wendy or Kathy? Is that HSCT or is that, are we talking mesenchymal stem cells for that? Because I think that the HSCT might have been down here as well, so it's sort of being run out of um, St. Vincent's in Sydney, but I, there, there may have been a Melbourne site, which may be what you're referring to. If you're referring to a mesenchymal stem cell trial, I'm, you know, hugely interested in hearing about that. I'm not aware of it um, at the moment. Um, thanks, Wendy. Um, I appreciate that you appreciate it. Um, but as I said, we've sort of, you know, in line with Brendan's question, um, we always feel like we can be doing more. Um, and so it's just a, a matter of working out what we can do um, and what's what's um, the most useful in terms of what we can achieve with the resources that we have at any given time. But um, we'll see. Um, yeah, I think, it, I, Wendy, I think it could be that that's where the Melbourne site is for the trial that's also occurring at St Vincent's um, in Sydney. Um, but I can I will can double check that after the broadcast. Hi Kelly, thanks for joining us. Hi Mandy, welcome. Um, so if you, <coughs> oh, excuse me, <coughs> if you are just joining us, um, I'm a little under the weather at the moment, so I apologise for the coughing and the, the terrible voice. Um, but we we've been talking about um, studies into remyelination, um, studies in on myelin repair. We've talked about um, mesenchymal stem cells um, as a potential for this. Um, we've talked about um, intermittent fasting and metformin um, and how that can be used. We've talked about, um, I just looked at my notes and I forgot, we've talked about my, um, the removal of myelin debris and how that can be important um, for remyelination. We've talked about the, the general process. So. Um, if you are just joining, remember that the broadcast does get saved to our Facebook page at the conclusion, so you can go back um, and watch the whole thing, um, as we've already been going for close to 50 minutes. Um, you know, probably watch it in fast forward so you don't have to listen to me for that long, or at least get yourself a, a nice cup of tea while you're watching. Um, but for those who have just joined, um, and I can see that we've got a, a lot of people on the broadcast at the moment, um, these Facebook Live Q&As are definitely interactive and they're here to give you information about what you're interested in. Um, so definitely if you do have any questions, um, comments, um, thoughts that you want to share, um, just drop them into the, the comment section and, and I'll be responding to, to all of them as, as we keep going on. Um, so while I wait for um, some more questions to come in, actually I'm going to give you um, a little bit of time to digest some of that information and, and drop any questions that you want. Um, I'm just going to have a quick drink of water um, so that I can, I'm not going to lose my voice. I'm just going to duck off screen quickly just to uh, show those. And I'm back. Um, so yeah, I've got a few more things that I want to talk about here, um, but certainly um, keep dropping questions um, as we go along. Um, so, uh, Kathy, Phil, Brett, Brett, I hope you haven't been overseas. No, no, no overseas trips recently. Um, Brendan Circles, good, thanks for the answer. I reckon the researchers in MS Translate do an excellent job. 
underlying my question is a concern that the policy is not an enabler. I think that without sound policy, there will be frustration amongst the researchers and desperation amongst people with MS. Um, yeah, I mean, what I will say in this space um, and what I think um, I can say pretty confidently um, is that what I think would be hugely beneficial um, in terms of helping to progress things more, and I, I think we're already good at this, but I think we can be better at this, um, is to communicate and collaborate more. Um, I think that researchers um, should be talking more amongst each other um, about the work that they're doing and seeing whether there is potential to, to work together, and I think that does already happen quite a bit, and that's why uh, meetings like Ectrums are, are fantastic. But I think it's important that, you know, all um, members of the MS community are, are involved in this. And I include um, policy makers, I include MS organisations, I include researchers, I include, definitely include people living with MS in the MS community. Um, and I include, you know, MS Translate and the, the sort of people who are communicating about it. Um, as sort of the, the bridge between all of these different things um, because um, you know I think that that is our best way of making sure that we're um, all on the same page and, and working together towards a, a common goal and getting there as quickly as possible um, you know there's no point you know one of the things that we talked about previously um, that's done in the UK um, is that with their research grants, um, one of the stages that any grant application goes through is that it gets um, read by a number of people who are living with MS. Um, the important part of that being um, twofold, I guess. One is a little bit about, you know, do you, is this research that you think will be useful to you? But also, you know, they see what's involved in the study um, and they get to comment on whether or not, you know, as a person living with MS, would you actually participate in this? You know, if it's a study where you're being asked to travel three hours five times a week, you know, you may not um, be in a position where that's something that you're going to want to do. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, it's critical that we keep the MS community central to all of this work um, in terms of the research and the policy. Um, you know, I think MS Translate tries to play a role in, in doing that and we um, are certainly always communicating back to research groups that we work with about ideas and thoughts that we've heard from you guys um, and that's led to a number of, of research projects so certainly, you know, your voice is important so keep sharing it with us um, but, you know, I think that's the part that I'm confident in saying, Brendan um, you know, I think that's something that we we are already pretty good at, but I think we can do that. Um, Carly, thanks. I'll go back and watch from the start. I only just found out about all this kind of info evening. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. So if you if you follow MS Translate, um, we do these relatively regularly. I always want to do them more, um, but we do them on different topics. Um, usually now we're going to start creating events so that you'll be able to to register your interest and get a reminder. Um, but yeah, they, they happen so often and we're, we're really glad that you could be um, part of it. it. It's a great opportunity for me to get to interact directly with our community, um, but also, you know, hopefully a good opportunity for, for everyone to get to come in and get some information and ask questions that they, they may want answered. Um, Man, yeah, I just wish we had something for fatigue. Yeah, look, it's certainly, um, for, it's the most commonly reported symptom for, for people living with MS and it's the one that, um, you know, most people say has the biggest issue um, on their quality of life. So, you know, we've posted a, a lot of stuff about fatigue before, um, you know, whether remyelination therapies end up having a, a downstream effect on fatigue, you know, we, we have to wait and see with that. Um, so, yeah. Carly, just as a, a question out of interest, um, where did you find out about MS Translate and the broadcast? Uh, always interesting to know how people find out about us, because um, obviously we want as many people as possible to know that these exist and to participate, so 
any information you can provide um, uh, will be interesting. Um, yeah, so I can see what is AHSCT. Brendan's already replied to that. Um, to Mandy. Um, yeah, so the Metformin story we've talked about. We'll post the link um, here in a second um, because I've still got it open. Um, so I've just posted um, the link, which hopefully you can um, all see. It might pop up um, to um, the work about metformin and intermittent fasting and how that's related to, to myelin repair. Um, but yeah, AHST is essentially chemotherapy and then a bone marrow transplant um, where you wipe out your immune system and then reboot it. And yeah, it's, studies have shown that this can be a, a potential um, treatment option for, for people living with MS. Um, so, um, one of the questions that Fiona submitted um, that I think we've talked about briefly, but I'm just going to go back to because I don't know that I addressed it directly. Um, she asked, do any of the disease modifying therapies or disease modifying drugs promote remyelination? Um, and if so, which are the most efficacious? Now, um, really none of the current um, medications um, promote remyelination or have really I mean, there's not a huge amount of data to, to show that, but, um, you know, none of them are really involved in this myelin repair there in terms of um, stopping new damage from occurring. Um, there was some data around the Ocrevus trials um, that suggested potentially there was a um, decrease in EDSS. Now, yeah, I think it was very minor. I don't personally, um, you know, it was a very small effect. Whether that would be related to, to myelin repair, yeah, you know, we don't have, again, it's just, this is just me hypothesizing. Um, um, but yeah, re realistically, um, none of the, the current medications work in this space. They have a very different mechanism of action. Um, and uh, so, so we wouldn't expect them really to, to be involved. All of these um, currently existing therapies really work to just modify the immune system in, in some way um, to stop damage from occurring, whether that's stopping cells from getting across the blood brain barrier um, you know, eliminating, eliminating B cells, um, like with Oculus, things like that. So, um, yeah, they don't really work in the, in that space. Um, and well, I think your videos from Ectrums are important and get MS Translate widely published. Thank you. Did So just as, I mean, this is very much off topic for while we're talking about it. Um, obviously at the meeting, the most recent meeting in Stockholm, what we did differently to Berlin um, is that I was there with Travis and we did our summary videos. Um, where we sat down and, and talked about, um, you know, highlights from the day, and we tried to publish those um, by the end of that day. Did you enjoy that format? Um, we obviously also did some interviews um, with researchers on site, um, but did you enjoy those summary videos? I think there's a fair chance um, that Travis will be uh, at Ectrums again this year. Um, so if those were something that you, that you enjoyed. Um, we'll look to uh, Blues Brothers style, get the band back together again um, to do more of those um, style of videos. Um, are there any, so Mandy's asked, are there any other diseases that impact myelin? Yeah, there are. Um, th there certainly are a number of other um, diseases that have, that affect um, myelin. One of the <coughs> key features that seems a lot to be, so like Guillain-Barre syndrome is, is one, um, but one of the key features that seems to be quite specific to MS, now again this uh, I will preface this comment by saying it's not, you know, MS is very much my 
area of expertise. Um, but one of the things that we know in MS, and, and it is quite specific to MS, um, is that while demyelination is common, and as I've said a bit earlier in the video, you know, you can get demyelination from a concussion, um, you know, through infection. The difference in MS is just that the, the process that naturally occurs in the body to repair that damage, um, that's normally very effective, um, is blocked in people living with MS. Um, and so that's, you know, while it's not necessarily an uncommon thing um, for, de for demyelination to occur, it's, it's the repair process that's blocked in MS that's, that's a big part of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that covers a lot of the stuff um, that I wanted to talk about tonight. We've been going for about an hour now, so um, while I do see we still have a lot of people watching, um, so I'm more than happy to keep going and answer more questions um, that people may have. You know, for sort of now, um, more than happy to throw the door open for, for just a little while just to answer some general um, MS research questions. We've sort of you know, we've been flying around a little bit as it is, um, but if you do have any other questions, if you're watching and you have questions about something else, feel free to drop those in as well. This is obviously always a good opportunity to do it. Um, so we'll um, move into that. The, the last thing that I will comment on that's on my um, running sheet of things that I wanted to talk about today. So we talked about that intermittent um, fasting study out of Cambridge and metformin. Um, what we're also seeing now is that there's just been a, a recent um, publication uh, just in January of this year. Um, also um, coming out of Germany, I mentioned an earlier German study about debris clearance, um, but this German study is just going to be a small um, study, 111 people with relapsing remitting MS, um, but they're going to be looking at um, a fasting diet um, and a ketogenic diet um, and see what effects these have. Um, you know, they're saying that there is some suggestion that this may promote remyelination. Obviously, we've seen this in, in animal models, um, but they're going to be looking at a, a lot of different things. I mean, they talk about whether or not having this dietary intervention um, impacts on the number of, of lesions, that's their primary goal to see whether that does, but also looking at whether or not it can decrease relapse rate, progression, fatigue, depression, cognition, quality of life, and whether it affects the gut microbiome. You know, they're looking at a lot of different things. Um, you know, that's it's quite difficult looking at a lot of things like that, um, but this is sort of one of the first things. Now, this hasn't you know, obviously that hasn't happened yet, they're just talking about the, the design of the study that they're going to do, um, but this is similar linked um, to that intermittent fasting study, and so this is now going to go a small study um, in terms of people living with, with relapsing or emitting MS. In terms of diet, the other interesting thing um, that we've seen um, was a study, it's a couple of years old now, um, but I need to look into it in a, in a bit more detail. Um, I'm just trying to bring it up on my, my screen now. I did have it open before. Um, it was a study out of Mayo Clinic um, in America um, where they looked at, um, again, this was done in, in mice, so this isn't a human trial, um, but they looked at how a high fat diet and exercise. Um, may be involved in myelin production. Um, and they found that um, the mice that were um, on a high fat diet and did um, lots of exercise training um, produced um, the most levels of the, the myelin proteins. Now, part of that being that um, lipids um, or fats um, are important in the production of myelin, so that kind of makes sense. 
um, but the, the exercise group also, they seem to get the best benefits from that. Now, I, I haven't looked at it, I've only just glanced at that one now, so I'll have to go back and look at that. But again, some more insight into how these things um, may be involved. Um, so that's sort of the last, that's all of the things that I had on my sheet. All of the topics that I wanted to, studies that I wanted to talk about. Um, but i um, happy, as I said, to answer any more questions if everyone's um, had their fill of information for tonight. Also feel free to, to say that. Um, we, we can finish it up, but I'll wait, you know, another few minutes. Um, and, and, you know, I'm happy to stay on for a while, while longer to see whether um, anyone submits any more questions. Um, but if I sort of don't hear anything in the next little while, um, yeah, we'll finish up for the night. But um, it goes without saying, you know, there's been a fantastic turnout tonight. Thank you to um, everyone that's participated, all of the fantastic questions, um, all the fantastic comments. Um, you know, it's as I, as I always say at the end of these, um, it's a real pleasure for me to get to do them. Um, this is the, the stuff that I enjoy doing the most. Um, even when, you know, a little bit, a little bit under the weather, um, you know, it's great to be able to come in on, on here and have these, have these conversations. Um, I always learn something from them. Hopefully you guys also learn something from them. Um, and as I've sort of hinted, I'm hopeful that we might be able to do a couple of these in the near future where it's me and a special guest, uh, so that it's not just always me that you're listening to. Um, but, you know, the, these events, as I said, these events really are um, about you guys. Um, they are so um, very much, um, they would be nothing. I mean, I could, I could sit on here and, and talk to myself. Um, and that's what it would be if you guys didn't um, regularly turn up um, and engage with our content and for that we are um, hugely appreciative um, so you know once again thank you to who participated tonight um, so Um, let's come back. Um, welcome, Cassell. Sorry that it took you this long to, to find us. It, uh, you know, we always have um, some. Um, it always seems to be a little bit difficult. Hopefully, it's starting to get a bit more streamlined now. Hopefully, with the event that if you click that you're registering to come to the event, you get a reminder um, to say that we're about to board, that the event's about to start. Um, it should get a notification that we're broadcasting live. Um, but never fear that, as I said before, the, the entire broadcast gets recorded and it will be on the, the Facebook page as soon as we finish here, so you'll be able to um, watch it in full. Um, or as I suggested before, um, just watch me and fast forward so that you don't get too bored. Um, so, I had a, another question come through um, about um, clinical markers of aggressive MS. Um, which is a, a new piece of research um, that's come out of a group of, uh, from the research group here in Melbourne. Um, again, from the Clinical Outcomes Research Unit, I'm not going to talk about that in too much depth tonight, but they've actually um, got a number of, of quite important publications that have all just in the process of being accepted um, that really give us much more insight into um, really being able to predict outcomes. Um, so predicting, you know, who's most likely um, from diagnosis to, to 
progress really quickly or to have a aggressive MS through to you know, understanding treatment choices better and how treatments work and things we need to be aware of. Um, so you know, we're again hopeful that we might be able to get um, some members of that team um, on board um, to share some of that research with you directly as well. Um, so we will um, hopefully, again, you know, there's so much exciting stuff going on um, that we're hopeful, you know, to be able to get the people involved to, to share those with you um, directly. Um, but yes, um, Kathy, Brett, you're always welcome. You give us the best information. Um, I feel like I could go very Donald Trump here by saying, you know, I have the best information, but I won't. I'm not going to get political. Um, at all at the moment um, so uh, thank you though I'm glad um, that you've enjoyed it hopefully we've, we've covered some pretty interesting topics again so this I mean we chose remyelination because we you know we did a poll um, a few weeks ago now um, asking people what they wanted the next topic to be remyelination got a, a few people commented and a, a number of people liked those comments so that's why we did this topic tonight, um, as always, trying to pick the topics that are most of interest to you. you know, if you uh, have ideas for future topics, um, let us know. I'm sure we'll do another um, poll in the near future um, on that as well, um, so that we can, we can already start to plan the next one. Um, so I sort of give, we're at a minute, a minute, an hour and 12 minutes now, so sort of go, I'll go to an hour 15, I'll wait another couple of minutes to see whether or not there's any last questions that come through. If not, um, we'll finish up for the evening. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, wants to have a bit of a rest. Um, but, you know, we will be, uh, as I said, doing more of these in the near future. Um, Margaret, thanks for your input and effort, Brett. I find it interesting that Oculus seems to be the drug of choice for neuros. And our family experienced no new lesions, but a 100% increase in disability. New drug, Mavenclav, which is a large ditch effort, is 23,500 for six tablets. Big Pharma is the only area to profit from MS. Um, I mean, the whole conversation about big pharma is a, a topic for a, another day. Well, actually, a topic that we've done before, you can go back and watch the... I did a, a Facebook Live talking about the role of pharmaceutical companies in MS research. Um, you know, I see both sides of, of that argument, and I can understand that, you know, that's, that's a, a lot of money um, for, a, for a treatment. Um, and obviously it's very difficult, I guess the thing will be um, that we will need um, we need uh, to be covered on, sorry I'm just going to got my fans going a bit crazy at the moment, um, if you can hear a noise coming through that's the sound of my computer overheating um, we need it to be included on the on the PBS, and I don't know if you know that's something I need to to read up on to find what ones have been the new ones that have come through, what ones haven't haven't been included yet are in the pipeline to be included. Um, that's obviously the best we can do, we can do in those situations. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, as to why Ocrevus is the um, therapy of choice. Uh, I mean, I don't. I'm not a clinician. I'm not a neurologist. Um, so I, I mean, I can't really provide any insight into that. Obviously, um, you know what I will say about Ocrevus, just in terms of how it fits into the, the disease process, is that um, what it does is that it targets B cells, um, and late in. 2018, 
um, a group out of Switzerland led by Professor Roland Martin published a, a really amazing paper where they showed what B cells do um, in MS um, and showed that really they were critical because we've always thought, and you may have heard of T cells, we've always sort of thought that um, MS was a, t a T cell disease, um, but they, they showed that B cells are actually critical for getting the T cells to start doing what they do. To, so they sort of kickstart the process. So Ocrevus or Ocreluzumab targets the B cells and I guess by targeting the B cells tries to stop this, the process of those T cells getting activated. Um, so you know, there's certainly a, a really clear link there as to why um, Ocreluzumab um, could be really effective. Um, obviously, you know, as with other treatments, it's not um, effective, not necessarily effective for everyone. You know, the, there's obviously a story with Ocreluzumab around, is it beneficial for, for people with progressive disease, particularly for, for primary progressive disease? Um, you know, that's probably another conversation um, for another time because there's lots that I could say about that as well. Um, but yeah, um, you know, thank you for your kind words, Margaret. Um, you know, there's not a lot that I can say about the other situation, but um, you know, hopefully you start to see some benefit um, with that new treatment. Um, Meso, could we do a general Q&A sometime, talk about things like why fatigue is such a big deal? Platform for us to ask random questions. Yeah, def definitely, we often do um, the generic Q&A. Um, you know, there's sort of every, sort of two out of every three tend to be just general Q&A sessions where I just come on and talk about MS research. Um, sometimes it's just handy to do a, a topic so that we can just have a, a focused discussion, so we've done you know, one, this one on remyelination, we've done ones before on the role of, of pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, we've done, done ones on the gut microbiome. Um, but yeah, look, definitely um, the next one will, the next one that I do solo, we can make a, a general Q&A. Um, the next one that we do might have a special guest, but I can't say too much about that at the moment until it confirmed. I don't want to get anyone's hopes up. Um, but yeah, definitely. Michael, keen to hear about Dr. Roy Swank, then OMS, RE, low saturated fats and lower progression with MS. Do you think this? Um, look, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it's probably something I need to, to read up. You know, I, I'm aware of all of the research. I'd need to do a much deeper dive on it before I'm happy to really give um, too much um, comment on it. Um, suffice to say that I think um, the more we're learning, uh, the clearer it is that diet um, certainly has a role to play, be that shaping the gut microbiome, be that looking at things like that Mayo study that was suggesting it could help in myelin repair, be it fasting and myelin repair like other studies have, have shown. Um, there is um, certainly an involvement or a role that it can play, but um, probably not at a point um, where I can talk too much about all of those different protocols and, and the data I need to relook over it. It's been a little while since I've, I've looked at it. Um, anxiety with MS discussion. Yeah, look, I, I would love to have a, a Facebook Live where we talk about um, psychological and mental health um, issues um, in people with a multiple sclerosis. For anyone that's followed MS Translate for a while, you know that my personal opinion is that it's something that we don't talk about anywhere near enough. Um, you know, we there is lots of data, and this won't be news to to people living with MS, to you guys, to the MS community. Um, the rates of uh, mental health conditions are higher in people living with MS. I mean, studies have shown that you know fifty percent of people um, diagnosed with MS will experience depression um, at some point throughout their lives. Um, I think when we shared that on Facebook, the comment was that 
comments were that it was probably much higher than that. Um, you know, anxiety, we know that the, the rates of suicide um, are much higher in the MS community than in the general population. And I just don't think um, that while we're doing a lot of fantastic work um, in lots of different areas, I still think that mental health and even just raising general awareness um, in, in the public um, are two things that we can still do a lot more of um, to really shine a light on them. Um, whether MS Translate can play a role in that, um, you know, whether we do a, a series of short videos um, with um, people in the MS Translate community, if, if you're you know, if you're someone who has experienced um, a mental health problem um, during um, or subsequently to, to your MS diagnosis and are happy to talk about it, whether that's through a written article or whether it's, you know, a, a short little video where you sit down with me and, and we chat about it, um, you know, I think that it would be a great first step in terms of helping in that area um, and you know there is absolutely no pressure to do that because you know I know that these things are not easy to talk about um, it's obviously very confronting to, to talk about um, but we know that you know it's not something that is uncommon um, in the MS community um, and so you know for people to be able to hear of other people who are going through these things so that they know they're not alone I think that's, you know, a really powerful first step. Um, and I think it's important that people in the general community also see that sort of stuff so that they're aware of it. Um, and, you know, that message really goes beyond MS. I think that's true um, across the broader community when it comes to mental health. But, you know, I think um, certainly something we should be talking about more. Um, Maybe we could discuss why it's so hard and expensive to access medicinal cannabis. Yep, again, could be a topic for a whole Q&A, Debbie. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, I've said in these before that I think that um, I think that there's some strong evidence now to suggest that medicinal cannabis or certainly compounds, you know, specific compounds out of it can have benefits for people living with MS. Um, certainly in terms of things like improving spasticity, um, potentially reducing pain, um, but that in terms of what I've most recently looked into that, um, certainly the viewpoint from regulators here was that the evidence wasn't strong enough. Um, Currently in Victoria anyway, medicinal cannabis is only legal for um, children with refractory epilepsy. Um, as far as I'm aware, that's certainly how it started. Um, you know, whether that starts to get expanded to more groups and where MS would fall in that um, process, you know, I don't know. Um, it's certainly something I would, you know, I know that it's a topic of interest for people. Um, We've talked about the research into it before. Really, we need some people more involved in the process to, to be coming on and chatting about um, what what the steps are, like what needs to, if, if the thoughts are that the evidence isn't strong enough, then I, I would like to know what level of evidence is required, what they would want to see before they decide that it's, um, is strong enough to to make a call to approve the use of it for people living with MS. Um, but because, as I said, you know, there's certainly been some interesting stuff in that area um, that I think is quite um, strong.
Um, so, on that note, uh, thanks for saying, yeah, I'm fine, it's just a, sure it's just a 24 hour thing, I'll be better very soon. Um, but, on that note, um, if we don't have any last questions coming through, um, we'll look to finish up. Um, thank you all for a fantastic session. Um, thank you for everyone that's participated. Uh, if you are watching this back at a later time, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to go back and watch it. Um, if you weren't aware that it was happening um, and you would like to participate in future events, um, comment below the video so we get all the comments even after we finish the broadcast. Comment below the video and let us know that you didn't, you weren't aware. Um, you know, if you want to be um, contacted um, when the when these events are coming up, um, we can look to look to do that. Um, we can make sure that the process um, can happen so that as many people can get involved as possible. We just need to need to know. Um, so certainly give us that feedback. Um, as I said, hopefully we will be doing one of these again in the not too distant future, potentially with a guest star um, who will. I, I will only give one hint, and I'm not going to say any more, but it's a guest star who will be a familiar face. Um, but we will see, but all will be revealed on that. Um, Shortly, I can't make any promises yet, um, but you know, hopefully that will happen as well. Um, uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, keep following MS Translate. Um, stay tuned for all of the content that we've got coming out. Um, engage with it as you do with these. Um, you know, like, share, and comment. That's really helpful for us to know um, what sort of things you're interested in. Um, and thank you again. And I really look forward to. Um, talking to you soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks Kathy. Thanks Wendy. Thanks Debbie. Thanks Cassell. Thanks to everyone else who's been watching. Um, Kathy, I can't. I my lips are sealed. Kathy, I can't say anything. I can't, I've already said too much. So uh, you'll just have to stay tuned to all of our posts. Uh, waiting for that announcement if it's to come. Um, but thank you. Uh, I look forward to talking to you all again soon. Have a great night uh, or a great morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, and thanks very much. Bye, everyone.